Welcome to part two of our three-part interview series with Dr. Frank Sanchez, the newest president of Rhode Island College. When was the last time you did a listening tour? For all of us, is it really important that we just shut up at times and listen? Well, that is exactly what Dr. Sanchez did as he explains that he looked at the as-is for Rhode Island College, where it is, and then where can it go with the proper steps and the proper investments? What are the next steps but taking advantage, right, of the history of the school? So as you listen to part two, do so with what he said is emotional intelligence. And when you bring that to the table, you too will be thinking about what's the next step. the things people don't always contemplate that, that schools, universities, academia are so focused on investment and return. They see a lot of value in teaching and educating mm -hmm. and things like that. But ultimately, I'm sure you've got a capital budget. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty large one too. Mm -hmm. Those investments in efficiency, in, in balancing uh, the campus, the use, maybe creating renewables, has to have, I'm sure, a great return as oh, well. No, oh, it's, it's, it's a huge return. I mentioned, uh, again, our, our residence halls. Just by converting every single light to, to LED, um, you know, we're going to save the bottom dollar. We're going to be able to redirect uh, $2 million in the next two years. Uh, another great example, um, you know, we're uh, uh, constantly looking at ways to reduce the out-of-pocket expense for our students, and so textbooks. Uh, you know, you know, you know, amount of paper used in textbooks, but the cost of textbooks today, on average, nationally, is about nine hundred dollars per student. It's such a common complaint. It, it's outrageous, and so we're actually exploring now open-source textbooks, where students don't have to buy the textbook. Saves trees, uh, but it reduces cost considerably for our students. We piloted, for example, one biology book, uh, one section, multiple sections, but one biology book. We saved our students $100,000 in textbook expenses in that one book. And getting back to the flow of students here, a lot of kids are, are coming from real basic blue collar, they're working, That's right. right? And so that savings is yep. phenomenal for yep. them. Or, well, uh, we now, so that's one book. We have now 50-some faculty exploring open source textbooks, not just in biology, but chemistry, history, philosophy. Our goal is to hit about a million dollars over the next three years in savings for our students. And, and once again, it allows us to redirect uh, the general expense to students, the out-of-pocket expense, towards potential other investments that can enhance the quality of the degree. Absolutely. And <clears throat> when you think about the as-is for Rhode Island College, you've been here a relatively short period of time. Okay. And thanks to Sustainability Director Jim Murphy and the whole team, as you said, you have a really nice as-is. You, you've done some things at Donovan, right, around food and around food waste, That's around right. beekeeping. But where do you go from here? You, you take this award, it's an unbelievable impetus. Where do you go? You've mentioned a couple of things, but where do you kind of go from here in the next few years? No, I, th I think it's a great conversation with us, and I think it, it, it's, it, it's helping the conversation of sustainability. I think in many ways and in many communities, you see this emerging conversation about resiliency. And how do we as a college engage really the thought leaders uh, the real brain trust on this front, certainly within New England, but I think nationally and globally, and ask ourselves. Explain to us kind of resilience, both maybe in terms of what you have here and as part of, let's say, the Providence community. As yeah. An well, they, no, it's a great, it's a great question. So I think resilience really gets at what are the needs for for a state public institution. What are the needs of this state and of this region? and then look at how we build in systems, whether in our academic offerings and the type of values we train and educate our students, how do we guide them towards meeting those needs? I think that's the whole, the whole essence of resilience. And as in your short time in Rhode Island, have you started personally to get a sense of those needs and where you think those 
voids are and where the contribution might be? Uh, without a doubt, and, and we're, we're getting ready to launch our 2017 to 2020 strategic plan. And what we did, what I've been doing for the, I've been here about 11 months, and still, still a lot of learning to do, but I've learned a lot about the real strengths and the, Im the strengths of this college and the impact it's had on this state for many, many years. We're, we're truly an engine for economic development. I mean, when you consider 72% of our students, of our graduates, elect to stay in Rhode Island, they live and work and raise families and contribute to the economic base. We need to know how we, how we need to go forward. And so part of the last 11 months, I've been doing a listening tour uh, to get context, to get perspective. Uh, I'm a big believer that we, before we can think about how to go forward, we need to know where we're at today. But through that process, we've identified five real areas of strengths, what we're calling pillars of our strategic plan. And they focus on key areas that I think will drive the institution forward. Uh, uh, certainly learning innovation. I would put our faculty up to any other faculty when it comes to faculty-student interaction. The mentoring, the coaching, the guided participation that happens in our classroom is really second to none. And we see that through a, a long history of experiential learning, senior capstone projects, a work that really shows uh, you know, faculty interacting with students. And I want to talk about the, the quality of those and the importance of those, but you surprised me in a way where you said innovation, everybody's thinking technology, but really you're talking about person-to-person -person skills, that, teaching that, skills. That's absolutely right. It's and, great. And, and it, it blends technology. It's both high-tech and high-touch. And what research is bearing out is showing the most effective teaching strategies, they're, they're not the traditional, the lecture style, but frankly they're not online either. It's the blended and the hybrid approaches because that allows you to both expand content which we want students to have more content, but also expand feedback. So you don't see it all getting pushed to the web? Oh no, 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 absolutely not. And, and frankly, that's not our strength and that's not our wheelhouse. Uh, where our quality at Rhode Island College is, is it, it's about the mentoring, mm -hmm. it's about the coaching, it's about the guidance that we have exceptional faculty provide our students. So learning innovation is a big part of where we're going forward. Tell us about the other pillars. Sure. Uh, so uh, another pillar is very important is our, our pillar of student success. And we have re-engineered our operations around uh, student services, student resources, student affairs uh, to help connect the dots for our students so that we improve student graduation rates. Uh, we have to do a far better job. We, uh, again, re-engineered and create a new division of student success. Uh, we're just concluding a national search for a new vice president for student success. And once again, I think we can blend in new technologies. There's a new, you know, data is, is a big part of today's world and analytics. And how do we leverage Because we might be speeding into that digital economy, right? Oh, well, might be. <laughs> right? It's happening. Yeah. And, and how do we almost leverage on every level? It used to be you had some traditional jobs, maybe careers, but That's right. almost on every level, right? On, on every level. And as you, as you know, over the last 10 years, uh, certainly uh, back to renewable energy has outpaced oil and gas and coal Absolutely. over the last 10 years. That's where the jobs and are. And look at the job creation. That's yeah. right. And it's playing out in higher ed too. So new technologies are informing us how we can do business better. So student success. Um, community partnerships. Uh, is another I important uh, part of our future. For decades, we have had incredible- Give us example, examples of that. Oh, so uh, we do uh, wonderful work in our STEAM Center, uh, where we're connecting with industry leaders, sustainability, folks who want to do more sustain sustainability efforts throughout the state, and seeing how we can collaborate better. What I've learned, though, it's a strength of ours, but we can be far more strategic and far more intentional in our outreach going forward, where we can influence where our real strengths are around the health sciences. Uh, we are, hands down, I would argue, the leading nursing school in New England. And Aren't, so how do you parlay that back into the community more forcefully? Oh, so, uh, for example, we're producing top-notch nurses. Let's, while they're getting their training, let's offer that expertise and that support into, let's say, low-income communities where you're provi providing uh, health checks uh, as a great way just to give back and at the same time provide great training. Our national pass rates now on the NCLEX National Nursing Exam are at 98%. The national average is about 75%. Uh, the community partnerships, inclusive excellence 
is another pillow of ours. What we, does that mean? So what that means is we know that tomorrow's graduates anywhere in the world, for them to be effective in any industry, they have to know how to engage people with not just different values and attitudes, but different backgrounds, race and ethnicity, different abilities, uh, maybe sexual orientation, certainly different religions, different political backgrounds to be effective. And we know to be an exceptional nurse, an exceptional teacher, an exceptional social worker, not only do you have to have the technical skills, but to be real effective, you better have a good, uh, be able to demonstrate emotional intelligence. You better understand how to be empathetic and, and how, to, how to respect others, how to show compassion. I don't know any nurse that is exceptional that doesn't know how to do those things. I don't know any teacher, frankly, that's exceptional that can't do that. And so the notion of inclusive excellence is training our students to be effective in this changing global environment by being able to effectively work with people that are different from themselves. And it's such an important point because then it rises up to sustainability, which is really collaboration. It's unselfish, it's thinking about the next generation. As you think about your school's collaboration here in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. across the lines, business community, faith communities, uh, nonprofits, government agencies, yeah. It must be a tremendous asset, but something that's going to have to grow. And particularly for kids coming into all of those sectors to have maybe experienced that as well. No question. Uh, the way uh, cities, communities, uh, and countries are solving problems today, it's, it's this collective impact approach. It's bringing together government, with researchers, with higher education institutions, with K-12, with tech folks, with innovators and entrepreneurs, and creating brain trusts, uh, solution finding mechanisms to move really what have been uh, difficult um, challenges and problems in society and actually coming up with real solutions to move it forward. But it takes a couple things, right? We have to cast aside our differences. We have to be willing to break out of silos. We have to be able to do the things you talked about. Empathize, communicate, yeah. personal skills, and work on a, maybe one central goal together, yeah. right? When I think that's, uh, that brings back into focus this idea of resiliency. It really moves- Tell us the, more about that. Yeah, it, it moves more towards looking at what are the needs uh, locally? What are the needs in our communities, the state, the nation, and the globe? And you'll see a lot of the folks having conversations about resiliency, it's about food security. It's about Maslow's basic hierarchy of needs, but it's first understanding in a real fundamental way, talking to people, taking all of our knowledge, all of our research, all of our technology, only as backdrop information to then meet the needs of our communities. And, and folks, you have to have empathy, you have to have good listening skills, and, and you have to be able to have compassion without agenda, Absolutely. politically or otherwise, without agenda, and really help support communities going forward. And you bring up a great point. There's, there's an effort here in Rhode Island, as an example, to be the first state to solve food, mm -hmm. to be completely food secure. Imagine that. But how do you get there? It yeah. takes right all of those things, and it's really a lot of the kids today learning new skills yeah. as well that they're going to bring to the table. One of the things I want to ask you about is, is Rhode Island College and academia in general, their continuing role in innovation, in R&D, because it amazes me how much innovation is being licensed quickly mm -hmm. back into the commercial community. Right. No, it's, it's, it's essential uh, for uh, uh, the general public that higher education is, uh, the federal government invests in research, uh, supports research, uh, the research agenda of our country. The heart of it is, uh, is at our higher education institutions, our research institutions. I would add, though, I think the innovation beyond our research institutions, the innovation in how we teach and how we prepare healthcare workers happens also at all of our public higher education institutions. Uh, and that's uh, certainly in, in, in a very important role for Rhode Island College as we look forward. So as you think about the students 
that you'd look, like to put out there into the workforce, into society, into making a difference. Um, and when you think about, let's say kids here at Rhode Island College being involved in the green team or being involved in social work, being involved in real high-end charity work. Tell us about some of those programs here, some of those opportunities where they get out into the community, where there's real, you mentioned Capstone as an example, right. where there's pragmatic, hit your head against the wall, work with people, learn, achieve a goal, That's right. where that, tell us about that and how that's helping these kids. Sure, so so I think there's a, a couple ways, and I mentioned one a little bit earlier where you had a, a student doing a senior capstone project, uh, creating a hydroponics garden, and then contributing the, the you know the the food the actual produce uh, back into our uh, into our dining center but i think this is where you know the lead lab it's my hope that a student taking the lead lab that you know they're going to be uh, or taking that class they're going to be majoring in any one of our strengths academic strengths whether that be a, a nurse or the health sciences or that's in teacher education, we're the largest provider of teacher certificates in the state of Rhode Island. Accounting, right. Uh, accounting, we now have you know, a, a leading accounting program. We have the only publicly funded school of social work. So it's my hope that a student can begin to think through taking this class, how to apply sustainability, uh, uh, kind of the philosophy of sustainability, and again, getting the certificate around the operations and the maintenance of buildings, and then ask themselves, how would this apply in the work I want to do on a daily basis? How would this benefit me if I want to be a teacher in the school district? Geez, maybe that's something an assistant principal, a principal, a superintendent might want it or need to have those skills. Same with the nurse. I may start out as a nurse, but I may want to be a, a health administrator, a hospital administrator, uh, someone who oversees a larger infrastructure. Uh, same thing with social work, someone who's working for the city or the government, thinking about all the institutions that support uh, social services statewide or nationally. Th these are the type of skills and knowledge that I think I want students to uh, get their hands dirty to get in there and ask some of those questions. How does this connect with my community? How does this connect with the state? And how can this connect with the nation? And I think about accounting, because I, I feel coming from the business community and we are the business side of green, we need to teach accountants to, to really rethink balance sheets. What are true assets? What are true liabilities? That's if right. a company has a high ESG rating versus they don't, doesn't one become an asset, one become a liability? Shouldn't we be accounting for that differently? No, no, no absolutely. And this is uh, another example of how we're trying to model the way for that. And, and actually, the fifth uh, pillar gets at this very issue. And the fifth pillar is about institutional effectiveness. And that's where we, as a public institution, we are responsible for taxpayers' dollars. Mm. So we should be ensuring the productivity, the effectiveness, and the efficiency of the use of those dollars. And this is actually where the bulk of our sustainability efforts from the administrative side lie. It's saying, hey, you know, we can uh, see savings in LED lighting over the next two years. Let's go do that. Uh, let's privatize the bookstore uh, and save our students $300,000 and do that more efficiency, efficiently and also incorporate open source textbooks. Uh, let's look at lighting options of the future uh, so that we can run this institution more efficiently and save dollars that can go back to, to providing and make a the higher campus quality more experience. safe. Uh, the lighting's great, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. It does yeah. so many things. No, it's exactly right. But that, that institutional effectiveness really hits on this very issue of how uh, we're looking at our balance sheet and say, you know what, there's just better ways, more sustainable ways that we can run as an institution. And account uh, for it. And, and, and account for because it. Because this is all so core to your job. Taxpayer dollars, return on investment, transparency, That's right. value to the state, right? That's right. That's right. No, it, it, it's a absolutely right. In fact, we uh, one of the first things I did uh, when I came in here and worked with the whole team to put in place a workforce planning committee. Because we said we had a lot of vacancies out there and we said, you know what, we can't just fill those vacancies blindly. We have to ask ourselves some fundamental questions. One, 
are those jobs needed? If they are, are the, did the job descriptions change? Or do they need to change? Or do we have other priorities? Uh, many, uh, higher education kind of gets a bad rap for just, you know, it's all additive. It's continuing to do the same and just building on doing the same. We are taking this opportunity to actually review all of our resources and realign them, marshal those resources differently if we need to, uh, both in, in savings by becoming more sustainable or in the, the human resources that we allocate on an annual basis and seeing if we need to realign those dollars. But as well. don't you make a, a great point? You've got to change and, yeah. uh, and adapt because that economy, that green economy, if we're speeding through a migration from fossil fuel to clean energy, it demands certain talents. If we're go going to whisk through that and we're going to the digital economy, it demands new skills, new talents. Yeah. So you've you've got to fill that void. You've got to almost sense where that's going. Well, and, and you're, you're right. We have to sense where it's going, but I'll tell you, I'm a big believer on kind of the evidence-based approach to decision-making. There's data, the return, the ROI. Let's crunch the numbers and say, hey, if we're going to see a benefit in the next three years, why wouldn't we do this? Uh, or, you know, is it worth the benefit of, uh, uh, over 10 years it's hard to say because the environment's going to change, the technology's going to change, the efficiencies are going to change, but let's crunch the numbers now. Let's be much more data guided in our decision making uh, as it relates to our bottom dollar and our sustainability efforts. In that segment, we brought up a big word, resilience. It's a big word for me, for our audience, for students, for the community to understand and to take action on. And keep in mind that resilience can be physical, it can be emotional, it can be spiritual, and it certainly can be environmental. Well, as we come into part three, Dr. Sanchez really starts to bring it all together for us because he talks about compelling. He talks about compelling change. He talks about dedication and answering questions that we should be asking ourselves. So it's not just him asking it of his faculty and of his staff and of his students, but it's what we should be asking of ourselves. And that is, what's next? And what are the big things that he can do, that they can do at Rhode Island College, that we can do to be part of the solution and not just part of the problem? <laughs>